Here we go. So I'm going to begin the recording. Good evening, my friends. It is Tuesday, September 22nd, Sanctuary Online Live, and we're welcoming you tonight, we're welcoming everybody. Really happy to see so many folks on tonight. And I know for many of you, this is part two, as Ken opened up last week with his first um, portion that we did on, on gender. It was entitled Gender, Forget Everything You Thought You Knew. And it was a, just an amazing presentation from Ken. Um, tonight, how we run things here is we would love it if as you joined us, you would go ahead and enable your video. Part of what we do at Sanctuary Online, our goal is to create community and to bring loads of different networks together to create some wonderful friendships. And mm -hmm. so also tonight, you're going to check out first, you're going to be in gallery view, which just means that you can see everyone. A little later on tonight, when the interview actually starts, I'm going to show you how to put yourself in speaker view. So when Ken is asking questions or Toby is answering, um, we'll have one, a larger view of the person who's speaking. Again, most of you have opened the chat box already, but we encourage you. This is a way, what happens if you would put in your first and last name, your email address and where you're calling in from, maybe how you got connected to a sanctuary community, um, we're able to send you an email out afterwards and it, it tells you either if there's a great slide deck like there was last week or we um, also share what's coming up in the weeks ahead every Tuesday night. So if you'd like to be on our mailing list, please make sure that your email address is there in the chat box. And next, um, we have a text feature. So if you've become addicted to Sanctuary Online like I have, um, if you give us your cell phone number, we will actually send you out a text reminder on Tuesday afternoon, and it will remind you not only to come on tonight to Sanctuary Online, but what the event is um, that night. I want to remind you we've had a really full September. Um, we did Zoom 201 a couple weeks ago. Last night, again, or last week was Ken. Tonight is Two Spirits, and it's an exciting night. I'll speak more in a moment. And then next week, we're going to round out September with our book club. We'll talk more about that um, later on this evening. But what I'd love you to do, my friends, how about unmuting yourselves and giving some appreciation to Ken? My goodness, last week was hey. amazing. Hey. Wasn't it? Hey. Yeah, Ken, it was our first 90 minute event and we packed every moment of the 90 minutes and it was fantastic. Not only great information, Thank but you. also um, Thank you. some real exciting, uh, great questions and answers at the end. That's where you get your video. So tonight, my friends, I am going to actually turn now. over my hosting duties to Ken. I will stay here and um, Barb, myself, and Cheryl will be monitoring the chat box. So as the interview goes along with Ken really interviewing Toby tonight, if you have a great question or if you have any kind of a question, I apologize for that. Go ahead and type that out into the chat box and Barb or Carol or I will kind of scrape those and we'll interrupt Ken before he asks one of his questions if we think you've got a great question um, for Toby. So that's the first thing. I want you to make sure that as you go along tonight, don't hold your questions till the end. Let's just have a very dialogical kind of conversation back and forth. And secondly, I'm going to, um, I'm going to take my sharing off. I'm going to have very few slides tonight. And what I'd like you to do is normally we like you being in gallery view so you can see, I don't know, nearly 40 boxes here with people in them. Tonight I'm going to encourage you to go up to the right hand of your screen and where it, mine says speaker view right now, which means if I click on speaker view, what happens is the person who is speaking um, is the person you, whose face you're gonna see larger, okay? And that way, I'm gonna toss this over to Ken. And Ken, I'd love you to um, introduce our guest tonight, Toby Johnson. And I would also hope that maybe you give us a little overview of the book that will be the basis of a lot of your conversation tonight. So Ken Martin, it's all yours, my friend. Thank you, Joe. And uh, I am really excited tonight to welcome um, as our special guest for this author interview session of Sanctuary Online, Dr. Toby Johnson. Toby is the um, acclaimed and award-winning author of 10 books. These books uh, explore the intersections of uh, spirituality and sexuality and mysticism and mythology. 
Um, and it, it's just a very exciting uh, body of work that we're going to be able to make available uh, to you tonight. Uh, Toby and uh, his husband, Kip Dollar, uh, live here in Austin. I've known Toby for over 20 years. Um, and by the way, Kip is a remarkable visual artist. Uh, on the, in his own right, and we'll uh, show you later uh, this evening how you can learn more about both of them and their work. Uh, with Toby's approval, however, before we begin our interview tonight, I'm going to give you a brief overview um, of the book that we're going to be talking about this evening, which is uh, Two Spirits. Uh, Two Spirits is an, his an historical fiction and what that means is that in this book, the major historical events are real. And many of the people are historical figures that you can go and read about in history books. But the literary device for historical fiction is then to place fictional characters within that history in order to move a plot, a storyline forward. And so this book begins in uh, the 1860s in Virginia with a young man uh, whose name is William Lee. And Will is about 20 years old. And Will's father is a very conservative, fundamentalist Christian preacher. And when he catches Will with another young man, Will has good reason to believe that his father and a group of other men are planning literally to stone him to death. And so he runs uh, away. And an older gay man gives him a letter of introduction to the Secretary of the Interior in Washington, D.C. And so Will goes there, he has an interview, and to his total consternation, um, without any preparation or training or experience. They put him on a train and send him west to uh, Fort Sumner in New Mexico uh, as an Indian agent for the federal government. When he gets there, he finds out that he is part of an experiment known as the Bosque Redondo experiment. This is all real history. And what has already happened before Will gets there is that about 12,000 Navajo women, men, and children have been rounded up from their homeland in the north. They've been forced in what history calls the long walk in a march down into New Mexico, promised with food and housing and a better life. And uh, so by the time Will gets there, all of that's already happened, but about a fourth of them, about 3,000 have died on the march. And when Will gets there, this, this uh, Bosque Redondo area, which is adjacent to Fort Sumner, the, these Navajo people are living in squalor, they're living in horrible conditions. And so it doesn't take Will long to figure out why he was sent there. And it is because uh, General James Carleton, who, who historically is uh, the general in charge of Fort Sumner, along with a, a group of other very powerful military and political men, have created this huge corrupt uh, scheme in which they have moved all the Navajo people south so that they can take over their lands and the gold and silver that they think they're going to find there. And they think Will will just be a passive and compliant and complicit part of what they are doing. The other thing that Will figures out immediately is that millions of dollars have been sent from Washington in order to provide housing and food for the Navajo people, that this same group of men have stolen most of that money uh, as well, just for themselves. Now, during this time, um, shortly after he arrives there, Will is trying to, to learn about the Navajo people, and uh, he sees this tall, slender, remarkably beautiful Navajo woman. And up to this point in his life, Will's erotic interests have always been toward other males. And so he is very surprised and confused about his own interest um, in this person. And over time, he finds out that her name is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, Hasma'a and that she is, in fact, a two-spirit person, which means that, uh, that Hasma'a's gender a biological gender, as we talked about last week, is male. Hasba'a has a male body, but her gender role is both male and female. 
And most of the time, she dresses and acts as a female, but not just any female, because as a two-spirit person, she is the very powerful spiritual leader of her clan, which is a part of this larger uh, Navajo population there. So over a period of time, Will learns all of this about her and about these other schemes and horrible embezzlements and things that are going on. And so Hasba'a and Will, along with several other people, over a period of a couple of years, fight to try to expose all of this corruption. And they finally succeed when the federal government in Washington sends General William uh, Tecumseh Sherman, the, Sherman, the real um, Civil War Union uh, famous General Sherman out there to investigate what's going on at Bosque Redondo, this experiment there. And he succeeds in closing it down and he is instrumental in making it possible for the Navajo people to move together together and to move back north to their own homeland. Now, during all of this time, Will has been exposed to Navajo spirituality, to the way in which they uh, embrace gender diversity, the way they understand human sexuality, uh, the way they govern governance within their own communities. And all of this literally has transformed him into a different person. And so as they begin to move back north, Will figures out a way to fake his own death so that all the white people are convinced that he has died. He and Hasba'a are already married, and the two of them join with the other Navajo people. They move north back into their own homeland, which is in what today would be the northwestern part of Arizona, and they live out the rest of their lives uh, together there. So that was a five-minute overview of a 300-page novel, <laughs> and uh, I think you're I think you're going to want to read every single page uh, of this. Um, but uh, as we as before we get actually get into that novel tonight, I just want to welcome you, Toby, and say what an honor it is to have you uh, with us uh, this evening. And uh, before we get into Two Spirits itself, I wonder if you would share a little with us about your collaboration with Walter Williams in writing your novel and about his seminal work in 1986 uh, um, entitled The Spirit and the Flesh, Sexual Diversity, American Indian uh, Culture, which is sort of the, the historical and uh, scholarly basis for the fictional work that you did. Yes. Oh, uh, Ken, uh, that was a wonderful summary of the novel. Um, I, um, I was impressed that you got most of it, you left out the sex. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> and the mysticism. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. Well, uh, Walter, you know, Walter Williams uh, uh, is a, uh, or he's retired now, but was a, a professor of uh, uh, gender studies at uh, the University of Southern California and has been one of the leading gay academics for many years. Um, <clears throat> he's always been interested in uh, alternative culture, uh, you know, not alternative cultures, but uh, non-white cultures. Uh, he's written books about uh, 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 Java and uh, uh, the Philippine area over there. Uh, he's lived in India off and on. Well, this, this book, uh, The Spirit of the Flesh, was his, uh, I understand, was based on his doctoral dissertation. And uh, as a student interested in uh, Native Americans, a uh, young, pretty young gay man, he went out and roamed around and visited Indian reservations all over uh, the Western United States. Um, he, and, and he's the expert on Native American cultures. Uh, I learned a lot from him, but he was the expert on that subject. Um, uh, <clears throat> he had, uh, uh, he had written a, a novel which was written as a um, uh, diary entries. Um, of uh, uh, Will Lee, the, char the main character. Uh, 
uh, and um, had never really been happy with what he'd written. Um, um, Kip and I had gone to the uh, March on Washington, the Gay March on Washington in 1993 and had attended some sort of a, a wine and cheese or drink somewhere uh, with the um, Lambda Literary Association. <clears throat> and uh, it was actually Kip who started talking with Walter and uh, mentioned that uh, I had collaborated uh, with uh, a man named Toby Murata, which is how I initially got into, into publishing. Um, and Walter was looking for somebody who knew how to write fiction. That's assuming I knew how to write fiction. But uh, anyway, I'd written a couple of novels. Uh, and uh, and uh, Walter asked me if I would help. And so he sent me the, uh, the manuscript. That, I think, is the only time we've ever actually met in person in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, um, that was in 1993, uh, over uh, the rest of the uh, uh, to, uh, 1990s. We worked on this occasionally together. Uh, I saw that the problem was the... Um, first person narrative. Um, it didn't allow you to ever talk about anybody else. And the character mm -hmm. only knew about himself, not about, now the, he's still the main character and everything is told from his point of view. But I propose, let's make it a third person. Let's make the story, um, uh, Ken, if you remember, uh, you know that this, the story starts out as, two parallel streams, one telling uh, Will's story as he's uh, growing up and going, starting this trip, and the other beginning with him arriving and meeting the Navajo. So interesting sort of mix. So I came up with these sort of schemes and ended up together, we, we wrote it. Uh, it took us uh, uh, till, so 2005 or so to ever be comfortable with the uh, uh, um, draft we ended up with. Uh, by that time, I was working as an editor with Levy Press and had a, <laughs> I was my own publisher, so I, I, I had access to uh, uh, publishing it. And uh, I wasn't the publisher, I was the, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I was, I was an editor of the company, but. Um, so, uh, in a way, it's one of my favorite novels because I love the story structure and the complications of telling the two stories and then having them come together. Um, so, one of the things to say about it is that because it is based on Walter's visiting and as a gay man back in the uh, uh, 70s when you know, a little uh, uh, promiscuous sex was part of gay travels. Um, so he went, went around and visited all of these reservations and had little romances and learned about the various cultures. Um, in putting this together in his uh, original um, uh, journal, he mixed things from one tribe to another. Um, uh, we ended up calling, we used the term hairy faces as what the uh, uh, Navajo called the white man. In fact, the white, the Navajo called them uh, uh, br uh, bright eyes, so some reference to eyes. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, the term hair, uh, hairy faces was actually, an, uh, was maybe a Sioux expression. So Walter ended up intermixing them. To some extent, as I was trying to piece all this out and, and you know, come up with a novel for it, um, I explained some of them, like, specifically like the term uh, two-spirit. Oh, let me go back for one more moment to say uh, what Walter then is, is famous for is introducing this uh, tradition of the Burdash into modern yes. American gay culture. Um, I, you know, Indian, uh, Indian experts knew about this, but 
we, we Americans know so little about uh, the uh, American Aboriginal world. We had no idea. Yeah. I, I think we barely know that there were different tribes. Uh, mm -hmm. And we certainly don't appreciate the various differences. Um, uh, Burdash was the was a term that the um, French traders gave to these odd people that they saw among the Native Americans who were men wearing women's clothes. And uh, uh, Burdash sort of literally means bottom, se sexual bottom. So, uh, which is actually a revered position and one should not knock it, but it's considered uh, dishonorable. So the Indians didn't like it. And in, um, uh, uh, in uh, 19, uh, in 19, let's see, yes, in 1990, at a conference in Canada, they came up with the term yes. two spirit, which was an Ojibwe term. Mm -hmm. So in the novel, uh, I imagined that a uh, an Ojibwe uh, elder who was sort of on a pilgrimage around the country stopped in and stayed with the Navajo for a little while. The Navajo called themselves the Dine and stopped with the Dine for a little while and were there when Hasba was uh, growing up and so instructed her in this terminology of two spirit. So we had a way to kind of within the fiction explain how we're going to use the term two spirit. Um, yes. So, um, so you know, there, there was a, certainly an effort on both our parts to tell facts of, about the Aboriginal mm -hmm. culture, um, uh, specifically this whole story of uh, the uh, imprisonment at uh, uh, Fort yes. Sumner, um, yes. uh, and that they were released. Most of the history actually, you know, really is true. Uh, uh, Ken, you were explaining this earlier. The one thing we projected into the story, it is true that a new Indian agent came. And it is true that that new Indian agent discovered the uh, chicanery that was going on and exposed it. What we added to the story was that that new Indian agent was what we now would call a young gay man who was fascinated yeah. by the uh, 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 gender openness among the Navajo mm -hmm. and therefore was willing to pay attention to their plight. All the rest of the, uh, the soldiers there are just treating the Indians like animals. Uh, but because Will was gay and uh, could have a sexual relationship, a romantic relationship, uh, with this uh, sexy ma young man who's dressed in women's clothes uh, allows him to then join the tribe and understand what's really been going on. Mm -hmm. What was the yeah. question? Would you repeat yeah, the question? It's a, <laughs> it's a wonderful collaboration. Uh, the, <laughs> when, when, the, when this book came out in 1986, uh, I happened to be the pastor of NCC in the Valley in North Hollywood, and uh, Walter Williams came and made a presentation at our church, and uh, we contributed some money to help him publish this book, and and so you know I had that information um, right up right from the very beginning, which kind of revolutionized my life and other people that I was able to share this with. And tell me one other thing before we before we get into two to uh, two spirits. I, Toby, I've heard you talk about your belief in the role of um, fiction writing in terms of uh, creating new myths and the importance of, um, of mythology and fiction in terms of uh, passing down and communicating a gay consciousness as a part of the evolution of human consciousness. Um, it, it, most of us don't know anything about this. But every time <laughs> I've heard you talk about this or read about it, it just strikes something really deep and important in me. And so would you talk just for a minute about that? Um, yes. Yeah, uh, 
I'm going to just uh, let, let me talk a little bit just about my own experience of growing up as a, as a, as a young yeah. gay man, not having any idea that I was gay, but knowing that there was something, something different about me. Um, uh, I got fascinated with science fiction. Uh, I think that's a thing that young teenage boys do anyway, but uh, uh, I got interested in science fiction. I read a number of novels that sort of became my favorite novel, several of Arthur C. Clarke's, where I, and I would read them over and over again because I loved the characters and I loved the message in the book. And I memorized portions. Uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, space trilogy, Paralandra and Out of the mm -hmm. Silent Planet. That set, and uh, you know, later on, I read *The Lord of the Rings*, and I think sort of this, a similar thing happened, which was happening to everybody around the country. When we read books, uh, we get into that reality, uh, and it's like an, it's an ultra, a parallel reality to ours. Science fiction allows you to really be. Uh, 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 speculative and wide-ranging because you get to create the world itself that you're talking about. Um, but I saw, because it worked for me, I saw this is a way to, the, the, that we speak to other people, we tell them stories. This is where our religions come from, this is where our culture came from. Mm -hmm. Everything is about telling people stories that dramatize mm -hmm. and make real uh, ideas. Um, so that instead of, uh, you know, there's uh, within the, I was just writing an author the other day and I, I, I gave him the bit of uh, literary editor advice that they always give. Don't show, uh, don't tell me, show me. The reader, the author, the, the reader doesn't want the author telling them how to think. They want to have a story which demonstrates how to think. One of my novels, uh, Secret Matter, which is my sci-fi novel, mm -hmm. real sci-fi, mm -hmm. is about aliens coming. They turn out to not be quite so alien. They're parallel universe and stuff. Um, but I, 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 I I think I managed to create an interesting, lovable character um, who has this interesting straight trait. I'm giving away the big secret of the book, but here you go. Uh, that uh, the, the, uh, this race of humans uh, have a much more developed uh, blushing system than we do. And their bodies actually change color um, as they are experiencing emotions. So their emotions show, and they therefore they can't lie because anything it would it would show. Mm -hmm. So they always tell the truth, um, and there's a complicated reason that has to do with physics. You know, science fiction has always got physics in it. So there's a reason why they have to come to to our world, uh, and. Uh, they have learned enough about our world to know that homosexuality is not looked on well here by at least by the religious people. And uh, they've got a different approach to homosexuality and sex in general in their culture. But anyway, so that, oh, and they're, they're innocent. One of the things that I experienced about being gay, especially when I was young and growing up and under, beginning to understand this, was what I've always called gay innocence. You know, the, the, the nuns had all warned us about the dangers of girls and uh, sex with women was well, wicked and things of the devil. Nobody ever mentioned, or at least I never quite understood what they were talking about <laughs> when they were talking about uh, falling in love with the other boys. It just was something that naturally happened and it felt good and innocent and holy. The love that I felt for my uh, 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 close friends, the one, especially the ones that I had a crush on, nothing ever happened. I, I didn't know what I was supposed to be wanting, which is so different from today. I, you know, kids now know uh, uh, growing up in the 1950s, yes. um, who yeah. knew what was going on? Um, uh, so I wanted to, in, in Secret Matter, I wanted to offer this uh, attractive character who had a neat trait, 
uh, for whom his gayness was uh, uh, part of why he was such an appealing character. And I, I know from enough, you know, I, I have enough fans who said they would still remember that character and mm -hmm. still remember the neat idea. Since I've told you so much anyway, and it's the gimmick of the book actually is that as you read through it, these various secrets are revealed about yes. who the aliens are and what they're here for and all that. But I'm gonna tell you the secret at the end, which is that uh, when uh, uh, the, the main, one of the characters um, reads their, uh, they, they turn out to be a parallel earth. They are really the human race, but in, a uh, uh, parallel universe, you know, the way science talks about that. Uh, and when he reads their scriptures in their story of Genesis, they don't eat the apple. Yes. And right. I think that, that I, that's one of the ways I think of understanding homosexuality. We, are, mm -hmm. we didn't eat the apple. And that's why we are not caught up in this duality of male, female. Mm -hmm. and, the battle of the mm -hmm. sexes and all this competition mm -hmm. and all this mm -hmm. stuff, everything is so much more innocent. Now, all of that gets squelched by the uh, anti-homosexuality and culture. I, I, I don't yeah. want to say that we are all like that, but that's why we all want to be. So fiction allowed me, a, a science fiction, allowed me to create a story to present that kind of an idea. What if we didn't get that? Out? That that as a new myth for us is just wonderful, you know. It it, it offers so much uh, uh, potential for us in terms of, of defining our own selves instead of being defined. Um, I I would like to to read a um, a passage from the book here. Uh, it's from uh, page two fifty, and it says, um, "In the strange mystical state." generated by the heat of the sweat lodge, Will felt he could see a God beyond God to a meaning behind religion. He glimpsed an important truth that to do God's will, to do what is good and right, isn't to do what other people expect from you, but to do what you expect from yourself. And it occurs to me, Toby, that like so many of us, Will could not, in this book, Will could not accept his own sexuality, he couldn't embrace gender diversity until he was free from all of those old, um, oppressive, sex-negative religious beliefs that he grew up with. And like so many of us, it was a new spirituality. It was a new understanding of who God might be and what our relationship with God might be that frees us to this new innocence and this new way of being in the world. And at the end of the book, Will uh, describes the events of his life as a mythic journey. And, and that just really went right to my heart in terms of, of, is this for us as LGBTQ sexual minority people, is this our, um, mythic journey in terms of classic, classic mythology, um, this arc of his life, is this our mythic journey that by which we are set free to become um, our real selves in the world and do whatever we're supposed to do? Great question. I think I have a great answer. This is what I think my <laughs> life is about communicating. Uh, you know, uh, part of my story is that uh, as, as a young gay man in San Francisco at a, uh, a graduate school taking a cl classes in comparative religion, I learned that uh, Joseph Campbell, remember Joseph Campbell, yes. the oh, yes. power of yes. myth? God, I had read his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces when I was in college, and it had really, uh, uh, awakened me to, awoke is the expression now, is it? woke me yes, to yes. The, a larger view of how to understand religion. And of course, uh, uh, Campbell's uh, uh, main idea is this hero cycle. Um, yes. Well, so when I was in, Cal when I was at this graduate school, Campbell was giving a talk and uh, uh, up in Ukiah, about 150 miles north of San Francisco. And I got a work scholarship at the retreat center where this was being held. 
Uh, I was invited to come up a day early. He arrived early. Uh, I had a chance to meet him uh, personally. Um, I was, uh, I was uh, sort of uh, one of the lively characters at the seminar later on, and uh, he took a liking to me. You know, he taught at a girl's college, Sarah Lawrence, and uh, yes. so all of his students were, were young women. Um, he was straight, so I mean, I'm sure he liked having the young women around. But he and his wife, his wife was a Broadway dancer and choreographer. I think she didn't want children. For some reason, anyway, they did not have children and uh, uh, considered their uh, creative works to be their spiritual children. Um, but he liked the attention of young men, sort of the way, you know, like sons, not that Joseph Campbell thought of me as his son, but, you know, just the attention of young men, the way uh, an older man would imagine his sons might have. Um, and, you know, what? It, it, as you were, Ken, as you were describing Will's experience of meeting the uh, Navajo Dine culture and seeing something different, mm -hmm. a different way, uh, mm -hmm. Campbell's big work is that if you look at religion from over and above, go up a notch in perspective uh, and learn about other religions, you begin to see yeah. the nature of religion itself and that the various doctrines and, and stories, the myths, and I use the word myth here in the most honorable way to mean yes. the, the secret wisdom that is communicated in these stories. Uh, the truth is not in the myths. The truth is in what the myths mean. That's what in the, in the book I say he uh, will saw to a God behind God, a truth yes. behind yeah. religion. There is this bigger, uh, and, and I think that gay people are naturals for this kind of understanding from larger perspective because we grow up having to rise to a higher perspective in order to understand what's going on around us. You know, we need to know when we have to keep something secret. Uh, yes. We are outsiders. We learn that we've got, at, at least for a while as we're growing up, we've got a secret. We're not like our parents in the same way that our siblings are. Now today, people are much more, e it's much easier to be open. It's much more, it's easier to be gay. Parents are not as shocked. Even so, in the process of developing one's sense of ego, one separates from parents. And it's something of a shock, I think, for us to see, well, we're not like our parents. Mm -hmm. Something is different mm -hmm. about us. Uh, so yeah. we have learned to understand things from over and above, and that'll because we've understood sex from over and above. We've understood yeah. the, uh, hygiene from over and above. Mm -hmm. uh, we've understood morality. You know, you you can't be gay until you realize that the Bible is wrong about those mm -hmm. lines. Hey. I mean, actually, who knows what those lines mean, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Oh, there's my friend out there agreeing. Uh, I'm, yes, being Mel's, no, I'm being Mel's editor these days, so uh, I, 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 I get to read his writings uh, fresh. You know, that, that, um, your, 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 your definition of myth there is so important to us, I think, because um, myth, I used to tell, when I was a pastor, I used to tell my congregation about religious storytelling that stories don't have to be factual in order to be true. You know, and I used to tell my congregation, all of my stories are true, and some of them actually happen. Yes. You know, so that, the, the power of myth is in the meaning, you know, not in the historicity of the thing uh, itself. I, I'd like to read one more uh, passage from the book here, because I think this is so um, important to this um, discussion. This is from pages 72 and 73. Um, 
this is another of these incredible insightful experiences that Will has. And it says, Will saw that the, that the God of Christianity grown old through centuries of religious warfare seemed to have become a capricious, jealous, vengeful deity obsessed with making rules and hurling wrath and condemnation on helpless human beings, a heavenly version of Will's own father. Changing woman, who were the, was the Dine's name for their deity, might make a much better deity. If she were a woman, she might understand people's frailties and be more likely to be nurturing than condemning. If she herself were changing, she might be much more likely to adjust her expectations to people's real situations, which were always changing. This, this is Will, supposedly, this is Will's first encounter with the idea of the divine feminine. Now, most Christians I know would agree totally with the necessity of ditching that old, tired God uh, that we're talking about there. But one, and I know that the, um, most of our religions, especially the religions of the biblical God, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, have been very patriarchal in, in every way. But I just wonder, Toby, in, in your experience and your observations and your studies, do you see human consciousness, religious consciousness, being willing to evolve more toward accepting the idea of a feminine divine? And how important is that? And what would it mean, you know, if we come to embrace the, the feminine divine as well as the male uh, divine? Yes. Well, let me say, having been raised Roman Catholic, that Catholics do have a feminine God, yes. the Blessed Virgin yes. Mary. There's Mary. some yes. funny stuff about her, you know, this virginity thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, in, in thinking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ken, you told me the question earlier, so I sort of thought about this a bit. Yeah. Um, uh, Joseph Campbell was fascinated with what he called the return of the goddess and saw mm -hmm. this as something that is happening in our culture. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's both caused by and it causes the women's movement, I think. There is a, uh, an awakening of human beings uh, that's happened, at least for us in America, in the last uh, couple of hundred years, that women are people too. Um, and uh, we have begun changing our ideas about sexual equality. And uh, mm -hmm. some of that is because we, under we finally came to understand sex. You know, human beings did not have the right answer to how it worked at all. Uh, they yep. thought the man was the important character. Right. Um, and, you know, it, it, it took up, to, what is this, we've been around for 50,000 years before they actually figured out what was going on. Because of yeah. genetics, and we now know that there's an equal sharing of, of uh, uh, genetic traits and all that stuff, you know. So as we learn mm -hmm. that, um, uh, we we came to see that women hold up half the sky. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, and in understanding God, we see that we need to include the feminine aspects of God. Uh, yes. One of the ideas I got from Campbell, um, and this, you, you know, p part of the way that the, uh, the return of the goddess, the, the role of the goddess is mythologized in New Age culture is this notion of the patriarch the matriarchy there is a kind of hypothetical time before we got our current uh, cultural uh, in which mm -hmm. uh, the gods were female and women mm -hmm. mothers were the ones who ran the society and men were the hunters who went out and brought in the food, but the women were the ones who ran things because they stayed home. 
with the kids. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Matriarchies happen uh, in lush, fertile societies that don't get particularly cold and nature is welcoming, nature is understood as loving, they, are, they, they can be more sex positive, they see sex around them, uh, uh, the world is alive and everything's blooming and all that. Uh, you don't have to do anything to stay alive, you can just enjoy yourself. In a desert culture, or a cold culture, you have to have taboos and rules. Because if you don't obey those rules, you're gonna freeze to death or uh, uh, die of thirst in the desert. There are all these rules about cleanliness. And you, Christianity starts out as this religion coming out of a desert culture uh, with all these taboos. Uh, uh, you know, the Old Testament is the story of the Jewish taboos. Jesus comes along. Mm -hmm. Christianity has got this thing about salvation. And, but, okay. The important message that Jesus teaches is not, has nothing to do with sin and freedom from sin. It was that the way to salvation, the way to live a good life, is not to obey taboos, but to care about other people. You yep. know, right now, yes. uh, wearing the mask, where's my mask, is, or for some of us, it's a taboo thing not to wear the mask. We wear the mask for cleanliness. Mm -hmm. And there's that idea, you either do it because it's a law, uh, and you must do it, or you do it because you care about other people. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the Jews had these rules about what was clean, uh, what food was clean, was yes. clean and what was unclean, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which had to do some what to do with their uh, uh, understanding of medicine and disease. And you could obey those rules because they were demanded by God. And you know, if you if you mixed the uh, uh, got the used the, the knife for the cheese on the meat, then you had to bury the knife in the backyard. Or you could understand the reason for obeying hygiene is because somebody might get sick around here and I don't want it to be yeah. you because I care about you. That's yes. Christianity. Yes. Christianity yes. is caring yeah. about other people and has nothing to do with sin. Jesus never yeah. talks about sin. Yes. So Christianity then, that religion comes to Europe uh, and especially France, Southern France is this matriarchal, what we call pagan, uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, culture where, uh, uh, environment. Uh, they have all of these nature religions, which end up working away in their way into Christianity. I won't go off into the yeah. Albigensian yeah. heresy, but the great yeah. cathedrals, the great <laughs> cathedrals are all built in honor of the Blessed Mother, the goddess. They are to yes. the goddess. You know, I, I, I hope that most of us are heretical at some level. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, you know. Uh, I'm sorry if I, if I upset anyone. Said, no, that's okay. It says we're all heretics because <laughs> Eastern Christianity declared Western Christianity heretic. Western Christianity declared all Eastern. So we're all heretics Here's at you. some level. But then, yeah. Toby, with our time running out here, I wanted to... Um, just Ken? um there's a Ken, yes. just to let you know the chat box is alive over here with questions so um okay you know joe joe let me let me let me say something here certainly um, i'm not even halfway through the <laughs> questions that i have for toby and we have another night about two or three weeks from now yes designated to talk about this i would really like to invite toby back to finish this conversation because um, you know, we're not even halfway through uh, the messages of this book, but there is, so Joe, if you can hold on to that for a second there, we've only got a couple of more minutes here before we really need to turn this back to you. But there is a quote at the very end of this book where Will and, and Hasba I have, they're, they're back, they've moved up into uh, their land and they're living together there. And Manuelito is the name that he now has 
as a Navajo. And, and here's the quote from the book. And Toby, this is so powerful to me. It says, Manuelito wondered if the hairy face culture of the future would understand the nature of two-spirited persons. He wondered if two-spirited persons would arise to help bring the human race back to its true homeland. Perhaps someday, two-spirit persons will hear tales of their predecessors, and they will remember their own deepest identity and heritage as spirit guides and leaders in recreating a religious attitude that honors the human body and honors the earth. And Toby, are, are, is it presumptuous to think that maybe that's about us and that is an invitation to us uh, and that that is our unique role as uh, given the unique spiritual gifts that we are we are saying we're bringing into this world yes um, yes um oh um you, you, uh, oh i just love, oh you know uh, i i wanted to observe that uh the, the we we need to be careful with this uh uh with the Native Americans' uh, sense of respect, it's they don't like uh, the hairy faces, the white man, uh, appropriating mm -hmm. their mythology because they say we simply don't understand it. And that yeah. for modern gay men to say, oh, well, we're too spirited because we know about the Indians, that is offensive to some of them. And I don't want to offend anybody. And oh, I just did, though, didn't I? All this stuff about Jesus. But uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I, I think that, in fact, when, when we look at that history, it helps under, us understand who we are. It's not yeah. a, it, it's sort of about, I, I, in whatever way reincarnation means anything. Uh, the karmic vibes that go out or something, uh, uh, ripples in the spirit field is the term that I used in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, we modern people are affected by learning about uh, the, uh, the, the Navajo experience. Uh, it helps mm -hmm. us understand our sexuality. Uh, we can't claim to be two spirits in the way they are, but we can understand their culture is telling us lessons about ourselves. And I think, in fact, this is it, isn't it? Aren't the, 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 the role of, of, of modern gay, lesbian, LGBTQ culture has been to, to, uh, uh, to, to calm these patriarchal notions of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Yes, yes, uh, yes. The yes. fact that you now, on ev in every ad on television where they show a couple, they've got a, a, a straight couple and a gay couple or a lesbian couple. Yes. We're part of it now. And in most cases, the, the gays and lesbians are more attractive. <laughs> talk about wanna, talk about recruiting a toaster for oven for you a toaster oven for you uh toby i i want to just uh my time is just about up here but i do want us to continue this uh but there is one sent just one sentence at almost the end of this book after will goes through the whole arc of his personal transformation in which he says Will felt sorry for his father. The old man's narrow view of life prevented him from perceiving so many marvels. And to me, that, that just sums this book up. It is the idea that un, un, less than until we are willing to leave home in terms of everything that means, and unless until we are willing to be cracked open you know, by life and life's experiences, we miss the marvels. We miss the many marvels, you know, and, and that, um, I, I, I've, I've been telling people recently, if there was a go-to reading list for sexual minority people, you know, this book has got to be at the top of the list 
because there are so many insights in here uh, for us. And uh, with our time <laughs> over, I, I want to thank you, Toby, for this. I, I want to sincerely invite you back to finish this conversation because it is not finished uh, at this point. And I want to to show people uh, your website and how to access your website, uh, tobyjohnson.com. Uh, it is, this is a remarkable website. I told, I told Joe and uh, Barb not to show it at the beginning because if we did, we'd never get people back because they would just stay with your website. But there's so much wonderful information here, including information about all of your books, about how they can buy this book from you or through Amazon as well as your other books. A lot of information about you and Kip. And if, do we have that, uh, that slide so that people can see um, how to do that? If we don't, we'll get it. I do, um, Ken. Up, I'm just, um, so okay. here's, what I'm, here's what I'm gonna offer folks. We've got, okay. we've got to talk about next week because we have a conflict with the presidential debate. Sue's taken off, but there's a lot yeah. of folks that we always honor our one hour. So thanks, Sue, absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah. And there's also questions, I mean, uh, Victor and Lou and um, Kay and Jenny, there's loads of people having questions. Um, Victor, let me ask you a question. Do you have um, October 13th? Is that an open evening for you a couple Tuesdays from now? Ooh, a Tuesday. Let's see. <laughs> I can tell you. Yes, it is. Okay, mark your calendar, my friend. Um, Tuesday, October 13th is the night that Ken said we've always had kind of a spillover night that night scheduled because Perfect. we had a feeling these topics would be uh, just very powerful and chat. So and would Toby, you, would you be you? Able, Toby, would you be able to, Toby, can you join us again on October oh, yes. 13th? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you so much. Yay. Thank you. Thank yes. You. yes. And Jenny, same thing. Jenny, where are you there? Um, I'm just hoping you have October 13th available as well. Jenny, can you let me know? Yes. Great. You've got some great con con um, comments about the feminine here. So I would encourage all of you to uh, grab a yeah. copy of that of that chat list and we will continue this conversation. Ken, let me uh, pop you over to the, the um, PowerPoint that we talked about just a moment ago. So not only Toby's website, I think Toby, if I know anything about authors, I think you'd, you'd probably prefer if folks bought the Two Spirit book right off your website. Um, I know that an author makes more money coming off their own website than coming off Amazon's. Well, um, actually, let me say these days, you know, it's it's simpler with Amazon. If you okay, just and there's from Amazon. Uh, I think it's actually cheaper, uh, especially if you've got Amazon Prime. Prime. Uh, okay. And uh, and then I don't have to go to the post office. Certainly. All right. Then there's, our, there's our direction. Please buy Tony's book from Amazon. Um, I would always say, please use Amazon Smile to make sure that every yes. dollar you spend on Amazon, a little portion of that comes to Sanctuary Online. If you have any questions about that, please speak to us in the chat box and we'll help you with that. Um, but Toby Johnson. Can I say um, one, th one thing more? Uh, sure. if, if you would like to buy the book, uh, go to my website and start there to go to Amazon. Exactly. Then I get a, I then I get a that, commission. Toby. And it isn't so much the commission. It's level no, six I, I was or just going to say that. It's but easier. It, leaves, it leaves a trail. And I think that's neat. It also is much easier. There are other books by a person named Toby Johnson on Amazon. I checked that out tonight. So if you, if you go to Toby's website, tobyjohnson.com, on the left-hand side, scroll down a bit, and it says um, Toby's books on Amazon. Click there. It takes you right to a full page of just this Toby Johnson's books on Amazon.com. So it's a much cleaner path, Toby, to get there. And I just want to thank you so much, absolutely, for tonight and for this conversation, which I know, I hope it creates lots of conversation, lots of questions that we continue. Um, October 13th. So mark your calendars. We actually have an entire full October November and December that we'll probably unveil to you next Tuesday night. And we're excited for, if you are a member of a church who needs some programming, we have a, an entire fall full of programming for you, including an amazing Advent um, series that will, will fill up your, your wonderful December. So I know we, one of the things we at Sanctuary want to do is to support those pastors and staffs who are simply tired because of the extra strain 
um, COVID has put on, on their work. And so we want to be a place of, of possible safe yet challenging programming. And every Tuesday night, we have something booked now through New Year's. Um, on that note, Cheryl Meyer, you are supposed to be up next week to talk about our monthly book, which everyone has been so excited about, Where the Crawdads Sing. And of course, we just discovered, I think, tonight that the first presidential debate will occur at the very end of the hour, um, Cheryl. So I'll, I'll let you have this conversation here. It will not interfere exactly. The presidential debates begin at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, but I know there are the talking heads in front of that um, debate, and some folks may, Ken Martin, didn't say that loud, um, <laughs> may want to um, be part of that conversation. So Cheryl, why don't you pick this up and see if you guys want to do this anyway, or move it possibly to the Wednesday evening. I'm, I'm thinking that it might be wise to move it to Wednesday if everybody feels okay with that. And I, we can go back out and talk to people who were interested, or seemed like they were interested in the book club. So um, we'll go, you know, we can contact them. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that we can move it to the Wednesday and that's probably what we'll do. Okay. The after that, yeah. This, my friends, because I just messed up, is a slide of Toby's page on Amazon. So once again, if you go to tobyjohnson.com, scroll down the left-hand side and hit, um, uh, author, uh, Toby's uh, Amazon author page, you'll click right to here. So I want to say thank you to everyone. It is one more Tuesday evening in the books, and we are incredibly excited that you have chosen to spend your time with us. We know you can spend it anywhere. It is COVID. Maybe you can't spend it anywhere, but you can spend it a lot of places. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so Thank you, thank you very much, and God bless. I'm gonna end our recording here. If any of you wanna stop and hang out and chat, which so many of you do, you can unmute your mics, and let's give Toby and Ken a little bit of sanctuary love. Unmute, and give them some applause, my friends.